Hi, thanks for joining us this morning. I'm Chrissy Mernon. My guest is Greg Harmon. He's an independent journalist. His first book is After Depression, and it's the story of him, his depression, and his treatment of it, and what he's he's emerged from the other side of it. That's it? Yeah, I would emerging. I mean, emerging. It's, not a, it's not a closed You're, chapter. I don't know where that comes. If there's spontaneous healing in this world, I'd love to hear about it. But you're on top of it? I would say so. Uh Uh-huh. I mean, I've got multiple strategies that I've, I've learned to, you know, implement that, yeah, that keep me riding pretty well. Okay. And so Mm -hmm. you found, I guess, hope and help through synchronized transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's a mouthful. It is. Yeah. I had to write it. I have to read this carefully because yeah. I don't want to mess it up. And so STMS, what, mm-hmm. you know, I'll ask you what that is, but sure. first let, let's, um, you know, before we started today, we were talking about, you know, that uh, depression is really um, widespread. Oh yeah. But oh, yeah. hidden. Yeah. And not talked about because it can, it can hurt you. There's still um, really a pretty raging stigma against those who have or admit to uh, having a mental illness, or as my partner prefers, a mental intensity. Uh, it really is a spectrum of experience and not, uh, I believe, you know, a scattershot of all these different, uh, you know, distinctions, whether it's schizophrenia, whether it's bipolar, whether it's major depressive disorder, whether it's, I don't know, delusional personality, uh, borderline. It's just a range of experience. And I think that, yeah, there is a big stigma. I've spent time with people in the military who raised their hand and said, I'm feeling suicidal. I, I, I can't control my, you know, my feel, these feelings. And their careers are over. They, are, they will not be promoted. That's it. Uh, people in business who lose their jobs. Uh, I mean, so it's, it's really out there. I think we're a much more tolerant society in some ways. Um, but this is an area that's still emerging. And um, there's a lot of folks out there just pushing for rights. Rebecca Helderbrand from Clarity Child Guidance Center comes here often mm-hmm. as a, an interview subject, and she talks about, you know, that if someone broke their arm, if a child mm-hmm. broke their arm, oh, yeah. that, you know, there'd be all this attention, everyone would sign mm-hmm. the cast, they'd come mm-hmm. back to school and be welcomed. Yeah, that's People, a great analogy. Yeah, uh-huh. when someone's sick, you bring them food, cakes, but when someone has mental illness. Right, pick yourself up, toughen up, get out there. Why are you crying? Why are you whining? You know, we there's no physical evidence, we think. Uh, and in, but in, in fact, researchers who, who get into this find that the body does respond in a lot of ways. That we do have things happening within us, whether it's in our, you know, we make this distinction between the brain and the body, but there really is just one body, okay? And whether it's happening in the brain, whether are, there are signals that uh, are scrambled, whether there are part, parts of the brain that are reduced in size or capacity through a long, uh, multi-decadal experience of depression, which as, as happens, or we've got inflammation issues throughout the body or, or things going on in our gut that we don't know about. Um, one psychiatrist uh, said recently at a, at a meeting I was at, he said, it's like people have the mother of all influenzas walking around and we, and we treat them like, yeah, just get up and get out, you know? So yeah, it, it is really rough because what can we point to? It's really hard. When did you first first notice something wasn't exactly right? When did you mm-hmm. first because mm-hmm. getting sick? When did oh, you yeah. or, oh, yeah. or, or do you think it was always there? Or no, I, I think uh, and for a lot of people, I think there's a point in their life where something is triggered. I think that people can be uh, genetically predisposed to an illness, and we see this a lot in, in various types of illnesses where you have these markers are just lined up a certain way. You know, my my father um, suffers from depression. His father uh, very much so. So I think there was something in the line, you know, it's coming down the pipe. For me, uh, something, I guess, as, uh, 13, 14, uh, I, I had my first panic attack, which if you don't have the language for it, if you don't know it's a medical issue, can be very destabilizing. Um, essentially, it was like a, a switch turned, and then suddenly I woke up like I was on the bottom of the ocean. I knew that, or somehow I intuited that my next breath was going to be my last. You know, you have that level of panic. Oh my God, this is it. It's ending. What am I going to do? And that feeling doesn't dissipate very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's drawn out. Um, It's just, you're in a state of unreality. I ended up walking through the house, um, eventually finding my mother and just groaning. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't create words, very alien experience. Uh, and, And that would repeat itself. You know, it was just seasonal. I mean, you know, a couple times a year, maybe. But when I reached my 20s, that's when my mood really began to flatten, where I just, you know, depression, we think about it in terms of an emotion, but there's a really great writer and biologist um, and former, perhaps, depression sufferer, uh, Lewis Wolpert, and, and his quote that I love so much is, you know, that normal sadness is to depression 
as normal growth is to cancer. I mean, it's so far outside of the range of the conversation even um, that he calls it only, depression is only, only tangentially represents uh, normal emotion. So it's not really, it's not about being sad as being just having like this vacancy uh, in your life. And, and that really for me went on for decades, for probably 20 years, you know, really, really bad, not so bad here in the middle. Um, but what it does over these years, it just, it robs you. Uh, and it just robs you of just the satisfaction and the enjoyment of, of every day. You can have a beautiful family, which I do, and yet looking back over your experiences, your times together, all you see is the suffering. You know, it just doesn't, it doesn't connect. It doesn't uh, link up in your mind and in your memory. Uh, so that went on for a long time, and really until I had this convergence uh, of really severe symptomology, uh, constant uh, irrepressible suicidal ideation along with, uh, con- you know, multiple panic attacks every day. Uh, just, and I had to, you know, our healthcare system is such that it took me months to get into a see a psychiatrist to get the medication that I needed. And, and eventually I did. So did that help? Did what, medication help? Yeah. What ha- what for me, and, and it, I've had varying success over the years with different pills, never felt like I reached a place where I really felt good. In this case, it, it interrupted my um, crisis, uh, which I think uh, pharmacology can be really good at. It did, but it left me feeling, quite honestly, disabled. I thought I was 42 years old. I still I was, I was drugged, and it was obvious. And so I began to research alternatives. People were recommending electroshock therapy, uh, ECT. Um, which apparently is not what it used to be and, and has a really good success rate for people with uh, treatment-resistant depression. I wasn't quite willing to go there. There are issues with memory loss with some people that go through it. And as a writer, I really, you know, I had memory issues already and I wanted to retain what I, what I had. So I began doing some research and I found something that has actually been on the market since 2010. Um, I have to back up. As a reporter, uh, I did a story about, um, it's called repetitive TMS, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. That's been on the market, um, like I said, since 2010. I did a story about it back then. I think it cleared FDA and maybe in 2008. And, uh, you know, some people, for some people, that's been a godsend. And uh, I couldn't afford it. It's very expensive. Insurance companies, I think, still fight it uh, in a lot of places, a lot of markets. I mean, we're talking about an investment of $15,000 maybe for a shot, for a chance. So I began to doing some research. I consulted uh, a woman who uh, is quite an advocate for uh, RTMS, and she said, well, maybe look at clinical trials. So I started looking at clinical trials. You know, these are experimental devices and drugs that are out there, and you go into the hospital and you say, hey, I'm willing to take a risk. Um, with, with TMS, generally, I think the risk is very, very low of any kind of side effect. So I was, I was pretty comfortable going in. The treatment I got, uh, as you mentioned earlier, is synchronized TMS. And uh, I mean, I'm happy to go into the, the differences. I think they are quite different and, and pretty exciting. Um, depends how, how far you want to go down into the technology itself. But the end of that process, about, let's see, six, nine weeks, nine weeks into the study, only three weeks I can say for certain that I had the treatment. The first six weeks are a double-blind study, so you never really know. Um, but I reached a place in myself uh, sorry, that I probably hadn't experienced since I was a child. Happiness. Just. Peacefulness. What, what, what word yeah. would you use? Gosh, I, I felt like I said to myself several times, this is the person I always thought I could, you know. I'm going to use the word normal. Normal? Normal and just free. Free. Free of self-obsession, you know, constant criticism, just malingering, um, the limbo of just, you know, you keep working. People with depression, you show up every day, and that's all you can really do, thinking, well, maybe something, maybe a little bit of ease, maybe a little bit of comfort is around the corner, and you keep moving forward with that hope. You know, hope is, you know, it's not the same thing as optimism, but it's willing to keep the door cracked on possibility. And, uh, you know, depression really tried, you know, the, the forces behind that really tried to, to, to close that door. There's a, a psychologist, a fairly famous psychologist, uh, Rollo May, um, who once uh, said about depression, it's, it's the inability to construct a future. And that sounds very clinical, but if you place yourself behind that experience, within that experience, 
if you can't see the future, then there is no hope. So it's hopeless, hopelessness. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny because the depressive experience really is a physical one, and and I'm pretty convinced that what we'll find, you know, this is a global epidemic. You know, the numbers, 350 million people on the planet. The World Health Organization cites it as the most damaging health crisis in terms of lost work hours globally. By 2030, uh, according to the WHO again, they expect it to be the most damaging global epidemic, global malady in terms of social and economic impact in the first, you know, in the, in the developed world and in the less affluent societies. Uh, it will be probably ranked only under AIDS and infant mortality. So it's major. Uh, you know, the people uh, who are struck by this around you, there's probably, let's see, uh, one in ten at any given moment are in the experience of moderate to major depression. That's going to be twice as high. Uh, you know, the, within those numbers, women are impacted twice as much as men are. More women than Absolutely. men are affected by it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I would say in the black and brown communities, uh, even much higher than in the white communities. I think that's a lot of factors behind that as well but yeah so um it's big it and, and we don't talk much about it, it i mean we're huge. talking about it now and, right. and hopefully you know hopefully right. reaching people and, and you're helping um people understand oh, i think the more, more people about talk about it the better right you know right. i think particularly those people who have experienced it you know the experts are great self-help books can be very useful you find the right one but i think yeah the more people who are have lived within the experience uh the more this gets um normalized, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Our guest this morning is Greg Harmon. His book is After Depression. He's an independent journalist, and we're talking about his dealing with depression. So this study, how did you mm -hmm. find a study? Because oh, yeah. you had um, STMS, mm -hmm. Synchronized Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation, mm -hmm. which you said is expensive, $15,000. No, wait, that's the RTMS. Oh, RT What's on the market RT right now RTMS. is Repetitive Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation. I have something I, I consider quite different. Uh, let me break down uh, that difference. What's out right now, it's, it's a magnetic treatment that uh, it targets a specific area of the brain. Typically, uh, a, um, uh, hopefully there's a psychiatrist doing the treatment. A lot of times they train uh, like a, someone underneath them to do it, and I think that's probably not quite as effective. Um, but they will target um, the, the front of the brain and kind of an area linked to the emotional experience, uh, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And they will uh, inspire through this uh, magnetic treatment a small electrical spark, essentially, uh, in just this one kind of square inch part of the brain. Uh, that is believed to then uh, uh, spark again, if you will, uh, metabolic process. You know, bring blood flow back to that area, um, uh, neural growth and, and restoration. Uh, because, you know, this area actually does diminish, you know, the longer you, and this is why it's important to get treatment quickly, it's because the longer you go untreated, the brain changes, you know, and you, and, and that's why it becomes harder and harder to feel good, because the feel good part of your brain uh, is, is just not away. kicking the way yeah. it should. So anyway, so, so TMS, um, there's um, a couple different companies out there with devices that have been approved that are on the market uh, that will hit a very specific brain region. What I what I found in synchronized TMS, um, which is still pending FDA review, in this clinical study, I found a, a device much much smaller uh, than uh, what you're exposed to with RTMS that essentially covers the entire cortex of the brain. There's three magnets that spin. You know, the first they they get your own natural alpha wavelength. You know, for me that's about ten hertz. Okay, ten. Cycles. I don't even know. It's like you're speaking a foreign language. Sure, I have no idea. So all of us have all of yeah, us. Yeah, sure. I mean, if they talk about you know in your sleep state, you know you go on delta state. You know when you're very relaxed, you're in alpha state, and that's just it's how quickly your brain is cycling energy essentially uh, when you're highly alert. You know that's another area. So at a very relaxed state, your alpha wavelength is unique to you. Okay, and like I said, mine is around ten hertz, ten cycles a second. They clock that. They program the device and they just spin at that level. What they're trying to do um, is to get the various oscillations, the various energy currents across the top of the brain, across the entire cortex, to spin at your natural level. It's basically, it's you know, a lot of people that work within TMS, whatever sort, talk about rebooting the brain. Rebooting, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking <clears throat> getting you back in sync, okay. Rebooting, yeah, absolutely, rebooting. synchronized, okay. right? Um, so anyway, it, the depression is often linked to um, that faulty energy. You know, you, you, you get off balance. 
and, and also the communication of the various brain regions, one to the other. Um, we have at the very top of the spine, you know, we have the very reptilian brain, the fight or flight stuff, and it, and it gets more complex as you go up. Um, maybe complex isn't the right word, but we evolved into highly, you know, our decision making qualities, our emotional qualities become very complicated and complex. So with STMS, essentially, you get that that those oscillations moving at, at your natural rhythm. And the belief is that that then begins to entrain deeper regions. So the communication across the brain begins to normalize to what is specific to mm -hmm, your biology. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. So it's all, yeah, custom. It's custom. It's, it's, it is. And, it, and um, you know, the results uh, of the trial, I have to say, the design of the trial, not the execution. The execution were third parties, different hospitals, 16 sites around the country conducted the trial. But the design of the trial and the reading and publication of the results were really the, the domain of the company itself that, that developed this device. So with that perhaps disclaimer, I'll say the results came out last month. They were published in a journal called Brain Stimulation uh, that found that um, this trial, uh, the results were better, significantly better than sham, meaning those who thought they were getting the treatment um, but weren't, um, they reported a certain level of improvement. Those who actually were but didn't know they were necessarily, you know, had slightly better results than that. So there's no treatment out there for serious depression that is really a cure-all. You know, the, the more the more devices, the more outlets we have for therapy, the better is, is you know, the way I run with it. But for me, walking out of this study was a profound experience. Um, and I can only hope that eventually it comes out on the market and people have an option. Uh, I also hope that it is uh, more affordable than what's there now. Um, the funny thing about what uh, Neuronetics is the company that has the RTMS that's on the market, um, I was told uh, in some of the interviews I did uh, on this was that they had to kind of work in at the last minute a, a, a better profit, a margin. And so they actually added a component to the machine that was this $100 Mm, towel that they place over it, you know, this disposable after each treatment. So okay. they, you know, and you need to clean one each time. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. you need to clean one each time. This device is it's small, it's portable, uh, and I think I, I, the company didn't share much with me after I came out and said, "Hey, I'm a journalist. I'm, I'm writing about this." Um, but they did say that yeah, they want this device to be something that people would ultimately be able to check out. Let's say at Walgreens or CVS or from their doctor's office, take it home, treat themselves. It, it really is that simple. Well, my question is, okay, so you had treatment. Is it is it something that you will have in the future that you need, you know, uh, like here, we reboot our computers every now and then. They need mm -hmm. another reboot, you know, mm -hmm. a, a, a checkup, a, that's a an great, update. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I interviewed uh, a woman uh, who's now kind of a spokesperson for Neuronetics and RTMS, and, and she, um, yeah, she talks about it as being uh, kind of a salvation, getting off meds, doing this, feeling great. And she had to go back in for, for more treatments. And then, you know, three or four, you know, more treatments, she's good for the year, right? Um, in my experience with STMS, you know, this um, evolving technology, I had about six to eight weeks where, uh, you know, phenomenal, phenomenal response. And then, God, the most crushing um, part of the whole process, now this is, you know, a year behind me, but, or a little more than a year and a half, I guess, uh, is seeing your old patterns, um, your old, uh, de seeing depression kind of come back, it's, it comes it's back in, in. And, and, and you're like, Oh God, this, this wasn't it, you know, and now, and you have to deal with it all over again. Um, so yeah, I think, I think all these treatments, they probably have a component where, where you need to have maintenance. Um, but at the same time, you know, putting my job and, and committing myself full time to recovery, researching, uh, mental health, psychiatry, uh, these various technologies, magnet-based technologies, um, I've gained uh, so much in terms of not only just self-knowledge, but an awareness of all the different strategies that people use. Um, there are styles of yoga, for instance, that you can boost your dopamine levels by 60%. Just, just lay down on the mat, enter a deep state of, of calm, tranquility. Nidra yoga is, is the style. And boom, you know, you're creating you know, compounds within your body that are, you know, you feel great. Um, you know, you have to do a lot of that when you've got major depressive disorder, and, and you probably, it's hard to get out of bed or off the floor to to move that direction, mm -hmm. you know, but 
yeah, um, yoga, meditation, um, move, other movement therapies, tai chi, qigong, getting outside, getting in the sun, exercise. And again, I went back and, and I'm taking a small dose of a bipolar medication I've never had before. So um, changed the way I eat. Um, started paying you know, more attention to my sleep and the way, the, the quality of my sleep. There's just all kinds of things that psychiatry just quit talking about. Yeah. Why? Why? Yeah. You know, because I, I, as you, you talk about this, you know, the new age thought came into my head where people think, oh, that's a little strange. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's not normal. It's not mainstream. Sure. But there might be something to it's it. It's coming. It's coming. And, um, you know, we went through, I think when, I think this says a lot about our culture and a lot about our idea of science. Um, but you know, starting in the 1950s, you know, really out of the World War II period, our knowledge of chemistry just boomed. And so a lot of that was wartime effort issues. Um, and, and a lot of it then moved into the realm of healthcare uh, in, the, in the years following that. And so we really had this biochemical um, revolution uh, and a pharmacological revolution. And so every, and, and along with this idea about mental illness, that everything fit into a certain slot. So if you have this, you have these symptoms, then you are that. You know, your diagnosis is kind of like a life sentence. It was kind of like you got blue eyes and you've got, uh, you know, bipolar disorder. Uh, and so we have a pill for that. You know, everything fit into a slot. And we began to see, in tandem with that, uh, mental health emergencies continue to climb. And they have been climbing steadily since we've been keeping record. And so it's really just been recently that psychiatry has kind of been forced to reevaluate its effectiveness. Because I think, you know, the recovery rate for folks is, is not great. I mean, maybe... And this is a statistic I don't have handy, but maybe, you know, half of folks are actually, you know, going in, getting treated and recovering, um, which is pretty dismal. Because and, um, and those are only the people who are getting treatment because there's a sure. huge, a huge a number lot of people are, that are self-medicating. Yeah, the yeah. self-medicating alcohol drugs and all the rest. Um, but uh, and so psychiatry really had to take a look at itself and reevaluate. And what we're finding is throughout history, um, there have been really remarkable responses. I mean, we think about mental health care as some kind of on a steady incline of getting better, getting better, you know. But if we look back, we find that, you know, in ancient China or India or, you know, even in the, like the Roman Empire, there were responses to mental illness. And in Rome, they had these spas. You know, if you, I'm sure if you could afford it and get out there, you go out, no stress, they take care of you, your food is prepared, you go down to these pools and these chambers with the sound of water dripping and you just... It's kind of like what the Quakers did in early uh, America. You know, they'd have these, these places where you go and just be stressed. Uh, and, and they have really high success rates. And then we kind of created prisms, right? There are there were metal boxes you would put people in that were in psychosis. And, God, I mean, it's like the Inquisition. Um, so, but we are coming back. And I hear a lot more within psychiatry and psychology than talking about this range of responses um, to improve health care. And a lot of it is, yeah. Um, abandon stress, um, exercise, get sun, take your B12, take your, you know, do you need melatonin or St. John's wort or some kind of herbal um, remedy? Uh, and, and yeah, the yoga, the movement therapies um, can be really, really powerful. We're learning a lot about, um, you know, how depression and all these mental states are really the, the physical and physical experiences that we interpret, we'd have to tell stories about because we're storytelling animals. Um, I've become really attuned to this because I, you know, you have to watch the precursor to um, a full-blown experience. You have to watch small levels of anxiety and interrupt them early before they become entrenched. Small levels of depression before it you know, evolves into something like a tidal surge you can't contain. And so, at those small levels, you know, I watch that, and I become convinced it really is the body is having an experience. You are feeling lethargic. Um, you can't get up. It's kind of like chronic fatigue. And you say, well, why am I feeling, you know, even without thinking it consciously, why am I feeling this way? And you start telling a story. Well, my childhood was like this. Or, well, I can't just, I can't do anything right. Or, well, I'm just feeling bad about work. I'm feeling bad about my family. I'm feeling, you tell a story to yourself, or I'm just a depressed person. You define yourself by an illness, by a diagnosis you may have received. Um, and so, I'm convinced that a lot of this is really just body response. It's, it is what that one uh, psychiatrist said years ago. He said it's, it is 
the mother of all influences. And we don't understand it. We know these various processes. Like I said, inflammation plays a part. The, um, the bacteria in our stomachs, we're, we're learning, actually creates these experiences. We, our serotonin, dopamine, all of this, I think as much or more is created in our gut than in our brain. And we don't know a lot or talk about that. Um, so that's an evolving science. And it's a pretty exciting time to be engaged in mental health. Our guest this morning is Greg Harmon. He's an independent journalist. His book is After Depression. He's been sharing his experience about depression. Now, you mentioned that, um, you know, especially hindsight is, is mm-hmm. what a gift, but your, your dad and grandfather, sure. you know, was there any treatment for them? Uh, or, or were they stoic and didn't yeah, talk well, about it? Well, I'll tell you what. My grandfather was military. Okay, he was so. career Air Force. Um, you know, you can almost forget about it. Right. Um, Not my, discussed. My yeah. father... And you just kind of, you know, I think in this, when you don't have access to good information and and maybe you're embarrassed or ashamed to... Ashamed. Ashamed. People are so ashamed. Yeah. Yeah. I should be stronger. I mean, you know, we, we live in a culture, you... you, you, you know, buck you it up. Buck it up. Pull your boots on, you know, and just toughen up. And so I think my dad did grit his teeth through a lot of this, and I did as well. And, and bless his heart, he's now going on... Let me see you. Um... He's up there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, going on 80. And he went to his first group therapy session. Awesome. A couple weeks ago. Oh, I bet you were so proud. So <laughs> just happy for him. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. And now he's he's kind of like, oh, my, this is so interesting. I meet these stories. I talk to these people. And there's just all kinds of you know. And he finds it kind of fascinating now um, where we begged him for years. You know, see, sit, do this. You know, the same thing I, I urge my mom to. I urge anybody to just, just talk to somebody. You know. That's a hard step. That's hard to mm. get get off the floor well, and get out of the house and yeah. say, "I need help." Absolutely. You know, and, and again, you know, I mentioned the military again, and, and you know, God bless these folks. Um, they do some of the hardest jobs, you know, that I can imagine. Um, and then when I, I when I first began this process for myself, I did some outpatient um, therapy at a local psychiatric facility or with the local psychiatric because I wasn't I, I did it at you know like I said outpatient. Um, but I would sit in groups, uh, so many military in there, you know, all branches. And their experience, whether it's PTSD, um, uh, depression, whatever it is, they're encouraged, at least in the manual, in the in the literature. You know, we, we went through this whole experience with uh, sexual predation, you know, and they're saying, you know, sound the alarm, raise your flag. Story after story after story, they say, yeah, I was about to commit suicide, or I tried, or I felt like I was about to, they raise their hand, they tell their, you know, commanding officer, they tell, you know, go up the chain of command, and they say, and now I've been redlined. I will, you know, I just, there's there's no future in the military for me. Because I was honest. Because I was honest. Because I asked for help. Because I'm sick. Right, absolutely. Yeah, that is mm-hmm. so wrong, but mm-hmm. you, you see that changing. Huh? Mm-hmm. You see that mm-hmm. changing, and a lot needs to be done. Right. Well, the, you know, American Disabilities Act, there's been a lot of conversation about that recently, saying, yeah, you gave us access. Yeah, you put a ramp, you know, up to the building so I can get my wheelchair up. But there's nothing in that that requires employers to treat those, you know, employees in, you know, in a more, in a you way that, that allows them to, to stay in there or hire employees out of that pool of applicants you know, that that they have the opportunity. And I think that 90%, roughly, of those with major depressive disorder report they have serious problems with work or family or, you know, what have you. Um, They're alienated and and they're... I mean, just think about growing up. When I was a kid, you know, you scroll your finger around your ear and you point, and they're stigmatized. Right. You get you, you get a label, yeah. We're out of time. Uh, okay. How can people uh, access your book or sure. find out more about you or, or anything Pretty else? Pretty easy. Afterdepression.net uh, is the website. It's the book website. Uh, if you uh, find information there, you're interested, it'll forward you to Amazon. You sh- you, there's an ebook up right now. I've kind of had an exclusive deal with Kindle. In the next few days, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, this will be the, the hard copy will be available. That's going to end the pike. So. Um, yeah, afterdepression.net, you'll find it there. Well, thank you for coming yeah. by and, and yeah. sharing your experience. Yeah, I really appreciate it, Chrissy. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Greg Harmon, After Depression.